Good afternoon. That's hard act to follow. That was really inspired speech. Um, let me first begin by thanking the Global Peace Foundation, Action for Korea United, East West Institute, One Korea Foundation, and the forum's partners for inviting me here today to participate in this very important discussion on One Korea. One Korea, whole and free, is an issue that I feel very passionate about, and I could not be more honored to be here to be the last speaker to conclude this forum. Since the early 1990s, when the North Korean nuclear crisis really began in earnest, the primary objective for U.S.'s North Korea policy has been very simple. Get Pyongyang to give up its nuclear program to remove the immediate threat. But I truly believe this approach of to the North Korean problem, making it all about North Korea's nuclear program has been myopic and ineffective. Having followed closely the North Korean issue my whole entire career, I feel I'm pretty convinced that the North Korean regime is never going to transform itself into a country that its citizens or its neighbors can live with. Since coming into power in December 2011, Kim Jong-un, the current leader, has been speeding towards completing North Korea's nuclear and missile capabilities that his father and grandfather have pursued at cost of billions of dollars and millions of lives. And I believe he's unlikely to give up the nuclear program or give it up until he achieves the capability to attack mainland United States with a nuclear-tipped intercontinental ballistic missile. I mean, think about this. In six years in power, he, Kim Jong-un has conducted four nuclear tests and 90 ballistic missile tests. That's double the number that his father and grandfather have tested combined. Meanwhile, the North Korean regime is and will continue to be the worst human rights violators and uh, weapons proliferators on this planet. So in the long run, I truly believe there's only going to be one happy ending to this long-running saga with North Korea, and that is unification of the Korean Peninsula. This is why I believe while we continue to ratchet up pressure against the Kim regime by sanctions and other means, our long-term policy and goal should be promoting Korean-led peaceful unification of the Koreas. In fact, all of us really have a stake in doing this. Um, what we can to promote this eventual outcome. And we will not, this will not only benef bring benefit to Korea, but also to the region and to the world from security, economic, and human rights perspective. To some degree, I think the measures we are pursuing, these uh, currently pursuing strengthening sanctions and other pressure measures, such as transmitting information into North Korea or highlighting North Korean regime's human rights abuses or help towards the unification efforts. The more we intensify economic pressure against the Kim regime, for example, the more we shake the confidence of the elites and threaten to stir uh, discontent among the very people that Kim relies on for support. The more we enforce sanctions and cut off the money, the more Kim Jong-un will be left vulnerable because he will have less foreign currency to under, underwrite the lifestyles of the elites, whose elite and the elite support is essential for Kim to maintain his grip on power. And the more we get information into North Korea from the outside world uh, and break Kim Jong-un's information blockade, the more we are able to help build a foundation for eventual unification. And as part of this effort, we may want to think about directing information operation campaign on unification to North Korea. I think this will be particularly important for the North Korean elites who are likely to oppose unification in serious ways. At the time of German unification, the German Ostpolitik, which is Eastern policy, contributed significantly to a to rapprochement between East and Western Germany, especially at the societal level. Um, most East Germans appealed to feel that unification would personally be good for them. They viewed West Germany as more economically advanced and rich, thus anticipated that unification would give them a better economic life. So building 
positive North Korean post-unification policy or quality of life expectations for the public and even possibly the elites and the military, and getting that message into North Korea would be, I think, very beneficial. At the same time, I think we need to also step up our efforts to uh, highlight North Korea's gulag and other systemic and widespread human rights violations, uh, which the UN Commission of Inquiry in its landmark 400-page report called it crimes against humanity. Like apartheid South Africa, North Korea is a moral abomination. North Korea is one of the most repressive places in the, on the planet. North Korean human rights abuses constitute a core threat, not just to the people of the North, but also to the region's stability and prosperity. And I believe this threat is as grave as the one that's posed by the regime's nuclear weapons program. I think the next important step we need to take is to, uh, to augment current military joint planning that's, that, that is there between U.S. and South Korea with a detailed and coordinated political, diplomatic, economic, cultural, educational, public relations, and legal strategy to tackle core unification issues that are likely to arise. But beyond the U.S.-South Korea alliance and moving beyond the Cold War, uh, beyond the confines of the Cold War framework, we also need to begin undertaking a diplomatic effort or diplomatic offensive to gain or to secure regional and global cooperation uh, to support Korean-led unification. This effort would involve promoting United Korea's vision and benefits to the government and people of the neighboring countries and key stakeholders, Washington, China, Japan, Russia, and that and to that end, various channels of intergovernmental, uh, public and private diplomacy and civil society engagement, I think, should be utilized. And to win support from the neighboring countries, the Korean-led unification vision should not be just a mere declaration, but, but the neighboring countries should be able to see sufficiently, and what they should be sufficiently convinced that the vision is associated with commitment and workability. So, for example, to deal with China's concerns, South Korea could explain to Beijing its plans for unification and what unified Korea's policy might look like, a triangulated policy balancing U.S. and China and contributing to sort of a win-win for peace in the region. Japan, too. Japan might look askance at the prospect of unification on the Korean Peninsula, but the Korean Peninsula presents a unique opportunity uh, for Japan. Japan could make important non-military contributions like development, aid, and assistance. And Japanese generosity at such a momentous time in Korean history could help repair the still very fragile relationship between the two countries. The significance of unification diplomacy is already proven by the so-called 2 plus 4 diplomacy by which Germany secured cooperation uh, of the United States, of the United Kingdom, France, and Soviet Union based on the German, two Germany's unification negotiation. And while Korean-led unification should be supported by regional powers, earning global support for unification is also important. This effort will not only require increased cooperation between South Korea, the United States, and Japan, but from the broader Asian community, such as Mongolia and India, and even other key middle powers, such as Malaysia, Indonesia, and Australia. And to this effort, uh, expanding public diplomacy towards citizens of international community by building complex network of political circles, media, academics, and civic groups would be helpful. And thanks to advance in media, and the internet, public opinion does have a great influence on international issues, and people could unite globally. And I'm thinking as an example, South Africa and the whole apartheid situation there. But beyond these efforts, the ultimate challenge might be, as Mr. Manzullo talked about, not only earning regional and global support for unification, but also convincing South Korea's own population of the wisdom of pursuing unification and building consensus over time. 
And to, the, for, and to this end, I think all of, all of you, and particularly our South Korean delegation, could assist in the efforts of persuading the public, your own public, that unified Korea is an investment in the future of the Korean people, something that would benefit the children of those having the, to pay the cost in the short run. So I don't also mean to suggest that unification would be problem free. I'll be the first to admit, and I studied this issue for many years in the intelligence community. I'll be the first to admit that there will be likely many fold problems that unification could bring, particularly in the short run. Even under the best of circumstances, unification of South and North Korea will be more expensive and more challenging than unification of East and West Germany because the two Koreas are further apart in technology, economies, ideology, and education. But assuming that we handle unification the right way, there is a potential for very happy outcome here. One Korea, whole and free. Just imagine the benefits of freeing 25 million people from the grip of the world's last remaining Stalinist dictatorship. Average North Koreans could move from starvation diet, both literally and intellectually, to the plentiful availability of food, information, consumer products, and all other benefits of modern capitalism. The majority of North Korea's 80,000 to 120,000 political prisoners could leave the government's slave labor camps, while, where most have been consigned there as for political rather than criminal offenses. In one fell swoop, you would eliminate the biggest source of instability in Northeast Asia, including worries about North Korea selling nuclear weapons abroad. A unified Korea would be essentially a bigger version of South Korea, just as free and even more prosperous. A democratic country with 75 million hardworking people. And the new Korea could emerge as the Germany of Asia, a new economic powerhouse and force for stability in the region. The two Koreas have been one people, one nation since the Silla Kingdom, one of the three kingdoms, have unified nearly all of the Korean peninsula in 668 AD. For almost all of its history, there has been a strong sense of unity within the Korean historical experience. One, ra one race, one language, one culture. This is what makes the current division of the Korean Peninsula into two halves more tragic and an astonishing anomaly in world history. It's a partition that makes far less sense than the division of Germany since World War II, since Germany, after all, was only formed as a unified state in 1871. There is much to, be grant, uh, much to be gained from unification of the Korean Peninsula, and this is what you spent last two days talking about. So I believe my conclusion is we must confront the prospect of unification with confidence, not trepidation. Thank you.